Hello again, and welcome to Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. I'm your host, certified sex therapist Lori Watson, author of Wanting Sex Again, and blogger at Psychology Today and WebMD. And I have with me Dr. Adam Matthews, my co-host, who's a couples therapist, psychotherapist, and president of NCAMFT. Foreplay is dedicated to helping couples keep it hot. Thanks for listening. Now on to today's topic. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. I'm your couples therapist, Dr. Adam Matthews. And I'm your sex therapist, Lori Watson. And we are here with our favorite, Lori, our monthly mailbag where we answer. This is truly my favorite one that we do. I do, too. I I love love it. it. I love it. We're getting so many letters, too. uh, I mean, emails, basically. Yeah, it's it's emails today or or text. (laughs) We're getting getting Facebook messages. Okay, letters. Letters. If you want to send us us snail mail, send us a letter. We would love that, too. I think that would be wonderful. Okay. Um, So we're going to read a couple um, and just see how many we get through. Again, thank you for those. If you want to send them, you can email at info at foreplayrst.com. But our first one says, hey, I love the podcast. I have a question. When I ask my boyfriend to try to be more romantic, he says I'm trying to change him because it's not in his nature to do the things I want him to do. It's nothing crazy extravagant, just your stereotypical stuff. Um, but I do communicate things I would like fairly often, yet he never does those things. I don't think I'm trying to change him, but at what point does it transition from asking for what you want to changing your partner? Is there a point where you just have to accept that your partner isn't romantic? Your favorite pet peeve, Adam. Ah, uh, my pet peeve? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the, the dating couple, right, who oh, is um, not getting their needs met. Yeah. I, uh, I struggle with this, and I'll be just be honest with the listener here. It's just it is a, it's a struggle of mine um, because – while she may not be trying to change him, right? She's staying in the rela- in a relationship that she's not having her needs met. Yeah, and so I find that I find that difficult. Yeah, I mean, certain things, right, are more tolerable than other things. Sure. Uh, you know, maybe he's like, you know, a stable person. He's loving. He is complimentary. He is great and bad. <laughs> And, you know, there's some things that, okay, maybe you can overlook that he's not very creative romantically, and that might be okay. But, you know, also, I often say if sex goes offline during engagement or during a dating relationship and you're not very sexual, please see that as a big red flag. Get Mm -hmm. that fixed before you proceed on to marriage. Um, I think what my pet peeve on this is the Popeye defense, the I am what I am. Yeah. You know, you, you know, you can't change me. Oh, and yeah. I, this is who I am, essentially. And if you don't like it, oh, well. It becomes a lot more toxic of an argument when you're married, yeah. you know, because you've already made that commitment when you're dating and you're saying, well, this is who I am and I'm not going to change. It's like, okay, so then I have a choice, right? Well, yeah, because she's asking when should she accept it. Mm-hmm. And, and I think part of the challenge is that she might have to decide how big a deal this is, mm-hmm. Right. Is it something she has got to decide if she can live with it for the rest of their relationship, right? Mm-hmm. I, you know, if is it something that is vital for her? Is it a non-negotiable? And is it okay with her that that's his defense? And can I just say, is he an idiot? <laughs> <You know? laughs> right? Because, I mean, women often, uh, this is how you share kind of that energy of testosterone is through good seduction and romance and and whether you like it or not women scientific research shows that that feeling of connection is uber important to her being sexual and her feeling sexual so right right now you know presumably she's very sexual but you know like eventually she will be dude what are you thinking here like how hard is it to be romantic and i've said this gentlemen Put it in your iPhone, you know, just like star different times of the week, go to the store, you know, order flowers to be delivered at sporadic times, go buy a bunch of gifts. And I know we've we've talked about about this, but romance is so easy, easy peasy. It's not like it's a concrete behavior, right? It's like, hey, I really need you to clean the bathrooms. It's like, I don't clean bathrooms. That's not in my character. You know, I just don't clean bathrooms. It's like hire a coach, hire an assistant to be romantic for you, to go buy the stuff. Ooh, that almost slipped out. And, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. This this is, to me, when we don't meet 
sort of the the concrete needs of our partner. I, I think it's significant. Yeah, and I would I, say I just think it's problematic. But she she asked the question: At what point does it transition from asking for what you want to changing your your partner? And this is what I would say, and this is something she can completely control: is when the boundary continues to be crossed. Right. And she continues to allow it to be crossed. And yeah. th- there are no consequences for that boundary. Mm-hmm. I don't mean consequences like punishment. Mm-hmm. Right. But I mean, things like she continues to exist and the relationship continues unchanged in some way. Right. Because she is it maybe is ex- I would assume I would hope if she's listened to the podcast that she's expressing that as a need that she's making I statements. She's talking about herself. Mm-hmm. She's being non-accusational and non-critical. If she's doing that. Right. And he Mm -hmm. continues to not respond and say, I am what I am. Then she if she continues to to be the same, then she's allowing her boundaries to be crossed and it's going to turn into trying to change him. Yeah. Okay. Give us another one. All right. Number two. Love the podcast. Been real help to me. I'm hoping for your help on the topic of breaking through the power struggle. I am the emotional and sexual pursuer, and my wife is definitely the distancer and has withdrawn nearly completely for quite a while now. I thought making us go to therapy was my screaming from the mountaintop, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. and disrupting the status quo enough for her to see that this is really dire and serious for me and for us, and she just doesn't seem to see it. What do you recommend for breaking the struggle for me and my wife when we are obviously so entrenched in this power struggle? Also, since this is a sex therapy podcast, one of the issues is we don't have much sex or any physical contacts. Maybe twice a year, I feel so alone out in the cold and dark with nothing to reach out for to guide me towards something better. Man, that is painful. Uh, I feel for I totally feel for painful, him, but it's yeah. really painful. So what, yeah. do, what would you say first? Where's the, where to start with this one? Laura? Yeah, so, I mean, this is a huge disconnect, right, physically, sexually, and emotionally. And he doesn't seem to be able to get much uh, tread in terms of making a change. He's suggested therapy. She's refused. He's saying, you know, this is what I need. And so people make decisions, right, to stay in marriages like this. Uh, for reasons, maybe financially, economic, uh, there's children involved. Uh, We are so about being able to heal marriages. But maybe, you know, saying, look at, you know, I can't live this way. Like, can you set some boundary that says, um, some boundary that is reasonable? You know, I, I had a patient who, her husband didn't produce any income. And he, he actually had a job, but he didn't produce any income. And and he used drugs. And, it, you know, it was just like, seriously? And, you know, she's like, but I've told him, I've told him, and what can I do? And I'm, you know, there, I've already argued this, and he still keeps doing it. And I'm like, wow, you are so powerless. You know, what about saying, I don't want you in the home until you are sober? Yeah. I mean, that's a really legitimate boundary that says this is too toxic for me or you know like I need to separate you know until we can get this marriage back on the road because I've been living like this for 12 years or whatever and it's I'm too alone and Mm -hmm. I'm not going to cheat I'm not going to you know go out but I need to have you acknowledge the reality of our separation Mm-hmm. We are separate. And so if I'm not in the home, it will become more visible to you. Right now, it's only visible to me. And, uh, you know, I hate separation. And I absolutely hate divorce. And I have enormous hope for marriages. But I think setting a boundary sometimes when it's immovable, yeah. um, you know, is sort of saying, I'm I'm exploding in front of you. I'm giving you the big warning sign, the, the sign that it's untenable. Yeah, it is. And I would I would also well, I think the boundaries are good there, too, because it you're saying I think especially with emotional and sexual pursuers, oftentimes those boundaries start to fall really quickly or they're mm-hmm. crossing boundaries. Mm-hmm. I would look at the boundaries that you need to set for the relationship. And there, mm-hmm. I, I agree with you that this in extreme cases, it, you might have if nothing else works, you might have to set that separation boundary. Mm-hmm. But there are some other boundaries that you can you can set and say that we're, I'm not going to continue in this way. The or, other. I'm not, you know, I mean, this this guy tried to get her into therapy and say, you know, the condition for me continuing in this marriage is, is that we to go to therapy, therapy every week. Yeah. 
you know, and it sounds like he actually in other parts of this letter, sometimes we don't read the whole letter, actually had found a good therapist and an yeah. EFT therapist, which is, you know, based in attachment theory. But sometimes it's saying, you know, I can't continue unless we do this. And yeah. That's your choice. You but know? I, I think the other boundaries that he needs to start to sell is make sure that he is still maintaining his sense of self mm-hmm. um, and who and his the separateness. Um, mm-hmm. As well, I know that may feel like if he go if he starts to pursue a hobby or he starts to spend time with friends, that he's pulling away from her. And mm-hmm. I'm not saying don't continue to set the need and say, I this is not okay with me. But a lot of times, I think that part gets lost and start so it decreases it, it decreases attach uh, attraction to each other. Yeah, so, find, find you're saying find activities that bring you joy and satisfaction so that. Your life is more fulfilling. And yeah. the only thing I might, as a caveat, say, unless you are divorcing literally, that other activity, you know, probably not another person of the opposite sex. No, right? yeah, I mean, of course, Even if no. you're saying it's just a friendship, it's like, okay, we, we know that's a path that's going to lead you down to an affair. And with integrity, if you're trying to integrously handle this marriage, you know, find joyful things to do to get your needs yeah. met. I think say finding areas that for you that stimulate you physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, Mm -hmm. like anything like that, that attunes to to who you are as an individual. Right. That are healthy activities in that way that are that are good, good things. And in those areas um, is going to increase your sense of self, your sense of uh, who you are and give you more clarity into the relationship as well. And unfortunately, at this point, take care of your needs sexually by yourself. You know, until you make a decision about the marriage. Okay, for Play Radio Sex Therapy, we'll be right back. Thank you so much to all our Patreon supporters. Right? Yeah, Patreon is a platform where you can directly support things that you love. We really want to expand the resources that we can be able to provide right. to you as our listeners. If you know our work touches you and our work helps you, we would be so grateful for your support. Just go to our website, foreplayrst.com, and there you can find a way to support us, and you can see our episodes and our blogs. And thank you so much, guys. Speaking with certified sex therapist Lori Watson from Awakening Center for Couples and Intimacy. Lori, what is an intensive? So an intensive is 12 to 14 hours of therapy all in one weekend. And it's a way to really make fast progress compared to weekly therapy. I mean, there's just so much more you can get done when you have a chunk of time. Overcome the challenges in your relationship and your sex life. Learn more about intensives and Awakening Center's other services at awakenloveandsex.com. At Matthews Counseling, we believe it is our job to come alongside you in whatever difficult challenges of life you are in and help you rediscover hope and to find the strength that you have to face those challenges. We strive to create a safe and comfortable place for you to explore who you want to be and identify the obstacles standing in your way. Oftentimes, the first step toward finding help is the hardest, but it can also be the bravest. Give us a call at 919-587-8018. Find us online at matthewscounseling.com. Net. We look forward to working with you. And we are back doing our mailbag. Our next uh, write-in is about trust and sex. Mail Author's here. mail, right. Um, says, my wife and I have been having marital problems for quite a while. She's never before climaxed. She doesn't trust me to go down on her, worried I might say something derogatory. Uh, I wonder if helping her climax could help her move past concerns. Wow, this brings up a whole there's uh, kettle of fish here, right? This is, a, this is only a few sentences, but there's <laughs> there's a ton. There's a ton <laughs> here. What, what would you address first, Lori? <laughs> I mean, I just want to say something about this. You know, she's afraid that I'll say something derogatory. I mean, uh, I think yeah. there's two parts, right? Women are so afraid that they smell bad, they taste bad, you know, and their anxiety makes them not able to relax to enjoy oral sex, which is a primary way women climax. You know, mm-hmm. most women climax with manual stimulation or oral sex, much more so than they climax with intercourse. So he's kind of saying, hey, you're cutting me off. This is I like to do this. But she's so anxious about it that he'll say something. So, I mean, first, I think he needs to examine his past. Has he ever said anything derogatory? Mm-hmm. That's a killer. I mean, you know, you got to take the play the long game. But he I would guess if I if he's 
I would guess that he would say he would answer that question and say absolutely not, mm-hmm. except that he probably jokes with her as he jokes with his male friends. Oof, right? That's he, not smart. He probably. I'm just guessing. This is just a complete guess. I mean, I have four sentences on this on this guy. Okay. But my guess is is that he is sarcastic with her. Right. What he would consider with his male friends plays around and jokes around. Uh-huh. And in his mind, he goes. I she knows I'm teasing. She knows I'm kidding. Uh, not and necessarily about oral sex. You're not, not about. Or, I'm not talking about oral sex. I'm just talking in, about in general, general. His his sense of humor and the way he believes it's okay to joke might be more sarcastic than a woman is ex- finds acceptable. Like guys can or rib person, each or, other. Yeah, I mean, so there there are women. I have met women out there who are sarcastic. Oh yeah, oh, like yeah, yeah. like. Go like if you not me. If that is if like my match, weakness. If no. you match Ugh. up on that, then that's great. But I guess that he thinks that it, what he says is not derogatory, and she would counter that and say that's not true. Uh, so she something he has done is what you're suggesting has made her anxious about him giving her oral sex. Well, just for her to say she's for that to be a fear of hers. Right. For that to be a fear. Right. Like I would say that's the first thing he needs. He needs to think about to how, check. To check mm-hmm. at the door and His ask sarcasm. that question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But then you're talking about – some. you were initially talking about something different about her own concerns, and it, those may be there as well, right? Right. I mean, obviously, if she's never climaxed, it's actually one of the easiest fixes. You know, so maybe you could persuade her to go see a sex therapist. Um, if she's anxious about oral sex, is she anxious about a vibrator? You know, would she be open to using that? Could you – Talk to her about it gently. Ask her if she would be willing to explore that. Say, you know, maybe you could try it on your own. I don't even have to be in the room or the house uh, so that you would have total privacy. But if she knows where she's going, what the goal is, you know, then it's often easier to experience arousal and know where you are and be able to tell your partner what you need. Mm. Um, I used to, when I, as a younger sex therapist, I used to always want women to manually stimulate themselves to orgasm, that I thought that that was the best transferable way to teach a partner about it. But now, nope, I go straight to the vibrator <laughs> because it's it's like a guarantee. You know, I know she's going to have an orgasm and then she can. <laughs> I'm killing Adam. You know. Um, uh, no, it's good. I just like, I like, I like the term straight. I go straight to the vibrator. You know. <laughs> I'm going to have a t-shirt made. <laughs> you can buy foreplay radio <laughs> sex therapy t-shirts that say Straight to the vibrator. I go straight to the vibrator. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway, so. No, because I want her to know the goal. I, know, I want her to know what it feels like because, you know, manual stimulation and masturbation or self-stimulation are, it's a harder thing to get aroused, yeah. you know, so, okay. So, yes, I think it would help her move past Look, some of her concerns. No, like, hang on. Like, I want to address, like, because I think, okay, I think you would agree with me. Oral on this. sex. Let's talk about it. Not just with oral <laughs> sex. Like, it's this assumption that he is making that if he helps her climax, that she's going to move past her concerns. Because I read that as not just her concerns about sex, but her, the problems in the relationship. Uh-huh. Right. And so I, you, tell me what you think about this, because I think that that assumption means that he is probably pressuring her sexually in ways that he needs to he needs to check at the door because mm-hmm. he's trying to solve the problem by getting her to orgasm like he wants her to climax does he, yeah does he want you her to, does he want her is this as big a concern to her maybe does this it is. make him a man or yeah. you know, a better lover if she climaxes? Oh, and I mean, I'm I mean, all I, about climax I mean I'm, I'm all about it I, I, I hear that and I like I mean you straight to the vibrator I'm not like <laughs> I'm gonna be on that for a while just FYI but it's still like 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 that idea. Your bananas, dude. I got bananas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, like, listen, like the idea, he just needs to check that assumption with her. Mm-hmm. Like if they're not on the same page that, that that is going to solve their issues, then he is putting pressure on her in ways that are not solving. It's counter. He's, it's pursuing, he's pursuing sexually. Yes. He's got an agenda. You should have a climax. And ironically, I mean, God bless you, buddy. I hope most men out there want their par- female partners to have orgasms yeah. you know, and take time and care about that. But it can become part of that toxic cycle yes. of I want you to have an orgasm. And suddenly she feels pressure and anxiety about performance, which decreases the likelihood of her having an orgasm. So, you know, I would do... You know, ask her about how about timed exercises? I don't, you know, all I want is for you to feel pleasure. I want to touch you 
so that you feel pleasure. Set it up for 30 minutes and say, you know, I just I just want to touch you and enjoy touching you. And I don't want you don't have to climax. You don't have to do anything. I just want you to let me know that if it still feels good, I'll keep doing it. You know, so that you can get to her enjoying instead of performing. And this sounds like a younger relationship, right? She's never had a climax. So probably I think your point of somehow or another the relationship is not safe, right? And if you don't feel safe and if you don't feel relaxed, you can't climax. Okay. Right. And just making sure that it that it's as important to her as it is to him. Yeah. Right. Hopefully it is, but and they can solve it together. But if not, then they're misaligned. So moving on. Next one. Next one. I have a nine-month relationship and a fine sex life. Uh, Two weeks ago, my boyfriend lost his dog, and it was very frustrating for him. And I was there for him. Uh, But it turned out that now he does not want to have sex with me, doesn't even want to kiss me. All he says is that he can't enjoy anything because of the loss of his dog. He said it is not about me, but I can't be sure and worry about the situation. Before the accident, um, I was also on a holiday for one month away from him. Do you think that it's possible that it's psychological? How can I help him us? And this is a this is a difficult one. Yeah, it's right. like a trigger event for him. Yeah. And maybe, I mean, our pets are significant, right? And so yeah. it's an attachment loss. He, he presumably is in grief. Yeah. Uh, you know, my husband raised Shetland sheepdogs and, you know, still talks about and understands and the dog's like secret language and talks about his old dog. I mean, you know, some people are pet people and well, this and is a huge loss. I, I actually had um, a, a good friend who just lost a pet, right, last week, actually. And it's it is the same. I would say, especially if you're an animal lover, mm-hmm. right? But anyone that owns a pet, right, they become part of the family. So this is a as just a big loss as if he lost a, a, a human mm-hmm. in his family, right? Mm-hmm. And not wanting to be sexual, not wanting to kiss kind of makes sense. Yes. She's also, I think she's correlating with some good intuition here. And I was also gone a month. You know, is he sort of seeing me as an unreliable attachment figure? Mm. I mean, again, it's a nine-month relationship. She needs to see... And set a good boundary. How long can I help him? You know, how long can I let him grieve and be okay with sexlessness? Well, that's part of what you know. that's part of what I'm saying, Lori. Is he, he lost him? He lost the dog two weeks ago. Right. So that two is not ago. like that's not very long. I don't think that she has to go to that level quite yet, but mm-hmm. she still gets can say if it doesn't improve, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that this I want to be there for you, but it's not okay. It's not okay for me that we're we don't I don't want to be in a sexist relationship. Right. Right. I mean, right. and I don't know that you say that within two weeks. You know, you That's might just I, be murmur teen sympathy for, you know, a few weeks. Like, hey, I'm, hey, dude, I know you're just grieving. This is so hard. You know, but at some point you say, you know, but I gotta be with somebody who's sexual. Yeah. Right? I, gotta, I just don't. I don't want her to cheapen the loss. Mm-hmm. Right. I don't want her to go. Well, it's just a dog. Because that it, he should be he shouldn't be grieving it in the way that he's grieving it because I think it would be it's it's significant so she can just be there for him and allow him to grieve and then eventually come back within a month or so a well, well, month from the loss at least and start to talk about it yeah um, I think yeah. would be a little more appropriate there okay so this is a we're gonna do one. Uh, pretty quickly, uh, premature ejaculation, no pun intended. But this is an international question from India. Thank you so much for listening in India. Oh, my goodness. Um, I found your podcast while surfing the net. I'm 35 years old, and I've been married for five years, and I'm suffering from PE. I was previously addicted to porn sites and used to masturbate frequently twice a week. I got married three years ago, and now my marriage is about to end due to premature ejaculation. On my first night, I ejaculated soon after vaginal intercourse. After that, my wife became very rude to me, and this led me into difficult situations, anxiety, shame, fear, anger, and depression. Over the years, I lost my concentration, and my PE has become more severe than ever. I believe that I could overcome this, but only with the support of my wife. So... I actually did correspond with this person and um, made some suggestions, and they had already contacted their urologist, had already used an SSRI, which is an antidepressant, but at low doses, 
is often used to counteract uh, premature ejaculation. And I actually see a lot of Indian couples, it turns out. And, you know, the difficulty is within the culture, they often are virgins at the wedding night. Um, there's very little sexual contact or even dating sometimes. He doesn't mention whether it was an arranged marriage or not, but sometimes it is. And it's very, 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 very important to produce children. And there's so much misconception because there's so little information. His wife could have thought that the premature ejaculation was him denying her, not wanting to be inside her. I mean, she could have made up all kinds of things in her head about what it meant. But I think fundamentally it also means, you know, you know, if you prematurely ejaculate before you get into my vagina, you know, then we're not going to have children. That's a big stressor. She may believe that she's only able to climax through sexual intercourse. Neither one of them may understand about clitoral stimulation as the pathway for her to climax and have pleasure. If you're listening, uh, dude, I'd love for you to listen to the podcast number one so that you can learn how to please a woman and what it takes for women to orgasm because even with premature ejaculation, you can be a satisfying lover and you know, letting her know that she's sexy. Um, I think they're living apart, though, at this point, and the marriage is on the rock, so that would be difficult uh, to be sexual. But I would say go back to marital therapy, you know, see if you can go again, and if the two of you can try. I hate that misinformation about sexuality is so destructive Mm. as to ruin a potential good match. I just, yeah. I hate this. And we see this, don't we, Adam? All the time, yeah. You know, that, that sex is so intrinsic to a marriage and and that people, you know, could learn how to solve these easily resolved sexual problems. They could learn how to make the other one feel good, both physically as well as desired. And, and really, it's our culture, which is in an American culture, it's sex-saturated, but it doesn't matter. I mean, people are not making love well. They're not making love that is hot. They're not having continuous erotic connection. They're, I mean, it's just breaking apart, and it breaks our hearts. But thank you again for listening across the ocean and for caring enough to write to us. We wish you well. All of you who write in, thanks a lot. You're listening to Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy, our mailbag. You can now call in your questions to the Foreplay Question voicemail. Dial 833-MY-4PLAY. That's 833, the number 4, PLAY. And we'll use the questions for our mailbag episodes. Hey, help us stay on top here at Foreplay. We'd love it if you would subscribe and share it with your friends. And please take one sec and rate and review us. Thanks so much. All content is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered as a substitute for therapy by a licensed clinician or as medical advice from a doctor.